Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. For the last couple of years, we've been following in the footsteps of Herbert Evans, who wrote this wonderful book, Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds, in 1905. Today you find Ross, Widget and Gizmo, and me, in the little village of Shennington. Now we're still in this extraordinary area with this dark red ironstone building going on around us. It's lovely here. This is a classic village layout. We're recording this with the mower in the background because it seems so appropriate. You can't smell it, but I can. The smell of freshly cut grass in the summer in England. It is incomparable. I just want to read you one sentence of what Evans says about this place. It's about the church, and it makes me a little nervous, and I'll tell you why later. He says, Shennington is one of the villages in which the custom of strewing the church with grass or rushes at Whitsuntide is still kept up. Now that, it has to be said, is enough to draw us here. We're going to show you around. Come with me. The reason for my slight nervousness is this. Last Wednesday, before we knew we were coming here to Shennington to investigate their Whitson traditions, I read for the Wednesday poem slot a poem called The Fairies by the Irishman William Allingham, which tells the story of the fairies who kidnapped a small girl. As I was reading it, I was reminded of a short piece of something written in 1888 by Lady Jane Francesca Wilde that went as follows. Whitsuntide is a very fatal and unlucky time. Especially beware of water, then, for there is an evil spirit in it, and no one should venture to bathe nor to sail in a boat for fear of being drowned nor to go a journey where water has to be crossed, and everything in the house must be sprinkled with holy water at Whitsuntide to keep away the fairies, who at that season are very active and malicious, and bewitch the cattle and carry off the young children, and come up from the sea to hold strange midnight rebels, when they kill with their fairy darts the unhappy mortal who crosses their path and prize at their mysteries. Hmm, okay, I'll try not to pry. I know the connections are a little tenuous, but coincidences make me nervous. Anyway, we know that the tradition of strewing the church with grass is carried on to this day, and is possibly unique to Shennington, as in the small number of churches elsewhere that something similar is done, they use reeds, not grass. May, or more specifically the Whitson and Trinity period, is the time for the annual strewing of grass in the church, something Christopher Horton from Shennington and his forefathers have been doing since the 1800s, and maybe even longer. The practice probably dates back to the Middle Ages, when the earthen floor would have been covered with rushes. These would have been changed once a year, and certainly in the spring. The first record of grass strewing in Shennington is in 1720, but we know that the village records prior to that were destroyed by fire, so we can believe that the tradition stems from well before then. Christopher says, We use the same scythe to cut the grass by hand that's been used for generations. No one else really knows how to use it. The grass comes from an area within the churchyard itself, which is why it's kept so long before May. The longer the grass, the better it lays. And so we will wander down the tree-covered lane from the magnificent village green toward the church, with the scent of freshly mown grass in our nostrils, to see if we can get a feeling as to why this church inspires such loyalty to tradition. I am, I'm afraid, prepared for a bit of a disappointment. Evans continues his comments about this church with this 
scathing sentence. The visitor, however, who is led to hope that a church which preserves this old custom must have preserved all else that should be preserved, will be disappointed. It will be enough to say that the fine Norman Chancel Arch has been taken down and actually put up again in the north wall of the chancel. His indignation jumps out from the page. Now, I have to admit that this church does confuse me a lot. Its proportions are clumsy, and it has been restored so much and so often that it has no real feeling of any particular period. The Norman arch is actually very beautiful indeed, but it feels peculiar housing the organ loft. The high Gothic arch supporting the east side of the tower feels particularly out of scale. I'm afraid on this occasion I'm on Evan's side. He decided to move hastily on, and we will do the same. A nice little blast of sunshine to let me tell you. We've had a really nice time walking around Chenington. It's been delightful. But we're now going to cross the valley, just a few hundred yards, to its sister village of Alcaton. Come with us. Whilst there is no denying the beauty of the village of Shennington, Alcaton is perhaps even more picturesque. The Church of St. Michael is truly unspoiled. Round the outside of the church is a cornice ornamented with figures in relief. The figures on the south side have been taken to represent the life of a man, and local tradition goes a step further in affirming that the man in question is the Black Prince, even pointing to his triumphant entry into London on his return from the French wars. Right next to the church is the venerable Jacobean rectory, built by Alcaton's most celebrated rector, Thomas Lydiat. The son of the Lord of the Manor of Alcaton, scholar of Winchester, fellow of New College, and a writer of European reputation, in addition to the divinity, he devoted himself to the study of astronomy and chronology. He recommended himself to Henry, Prince of Wales, who appointed him his chronographer and cosmographer, and would have promoted him to higher honours had he lived. But the prince's early death in 1612 put an end to his hopes, and he accepted the rectory of his native village, of which his father was the patron. In this retired spot he gave himself up to his studies and published many learned scientific treatises. Now, I don't expect you'll be tempted to make the acquaintance of his works, although they can be found in the Dictionary of National Biography, but you might be more interested in the fortunes or other misfortunes of the author, who, after all his toil, is best known now by Johnson's famous lines in The Vanity of Human Wishes. There mark what ills the scholar's life assail. Toil, envy, want, the patron and the jail. See nations, slowly wise and meanly just, to buried merit raise the tardy bust. If dreams yet flatter, once again attend, hear Lydiat's life and Galileo's end. In fact, Lydiat had at one time generously pledged himself as security for a brother's debts, and being unable to find the money, he was imprisoned, first at Bocardo in Oxford and afterwards in the King's Bench, until the warden of New College and other influential friends subscribed for his release. Nor was this the only experience of duress. A staunch royalist, he suffered plunder and imprisonment at the hands of the Radleds, and returned to Alcaton so infamously used by the soldiers that his health was seriously affected. He died at Alcaton in April 1646 and was buried in the chancel of the church. Enjoy this lovely little church with its elegant little 12th century tub font its good pews, pulpit and stalls all by the same hand, 
and an early 13th century effigy of a knight with a shield, badly weathered but no doubt originally in very low relief as the feet are stretched out flat. This really is a Cotswold gem. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, press the little bell motif so that we'll always then let you know what we're doing. Don't forget you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at the Cotswold Explorer and visit our website thecotswoldexplorer.co.uk where you'll find details of everything we've done in the past. We look forward to seeing you very soon somewhere else in the Cotswolds.